Welcome to the war from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you our fourth Adam's Mailbag episode. I haven't been doing these uh, Adam's Mailbag features because we haven't been getting a volume of questions, comments or such, that would really necessitate a separate podcast. But uh, I got, uh, just in the past week, Three pretty uh, significant emails, and I don't want to uh, give them short shrift or or just append them to the end of a podcast. So uh, we'll go ahead and get into uh, some of these comments uh, that we received. Uh, And you can email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I will say that I don't know at this point if they'll get onto the program. We're uh, into our last uh, 13 episodes of The War, and seven of those are already recorded. And I definitely won't plan on doing an Adam's Mailbag after the series. But at any rate, let's go ahead and get into the comments, and we start with David, uh, who writes in regarding to Mare Island and back. Uh, and he says, uh, Sir, uh, the to Mare Island back is uh, entertaining, But Douglas Bader was already well known. He was a British uh, Spitfire pilot who had lost both of his legs in the early 1930s. And Mr. Bader subsequently came back and, you know, provided really uh, heroic service uh, for the RAF. And I know why he wasn't uh, referenced in the production, but it was not as extraordinary as presented. Also consider Burt Shepard, who lost a leg in World War II and later pitched for a team that claimed to be in the major leagues. Admittedly, one game and for the Senators. Uh, Mr. Shepard pitched uh, one inning in the midst of one of those uh, blowout games. His normal role was a pitching coach with the Senators. Well, I, I do appreciate the story of Douglas Bader. But I, do, I still think that the Dr. Fight story was still uh, out of the ordinary. Even if this wasn't the first time that an amputee had flown a plane. And we have to remember that uh, Douglas Bader was uh, in the United Kingdom. And this was something being dealt with in, this, in the episode of the Dr. Fights we played in the United States by a, a U.S. military doctor. And the wider story of uh, Tumare Island and back was to really honor the physicians who worked at Mare Island and helped to rehabilitate men who, uh, many of whom really struggled with this idea that their whole life was over having lost this limb and the benefits of it and how the doctor helped them to find renewed hope and purpose. And while I think that uh, a pilot returning to flight and to serving his country after an injury like that may not have been a -a one-of-a-kind occurrence. It certainly was uh, extraordinary and beyond the expectation that anyone could have. Nobody would uh, blame a pilot for just going home and going into commercial pilot work. So I think, uh, again, a very good story, but I do appreciate your comments and the additional uh, historical information you added in. Then we received an email from Victoria who says, uh, Dear Adam, I'm enjoying your podcast. I just listened to episode 225 and will continue to listen to them in order. The best thing about your series is that it has placed me into the era. I am 62 years old, so was not around during the war. However, my parents and many of my dear friends were. I now realize that it was the war years as much as the depression years that shaped my parents and older friends' behaviors. They all seem to have that habit of thrift, wanting to reuse rather than replace. Uh, They take care of their possession and treasure old things more than new ones. You ask for stories. I have many uh, because of my friends uh, are in their 80s. My father was a pilot in the Navy, but the war ended just as he finished training. One of my Japanese friends and his wife were interred with their families, but a local merchant bought their family business for a dollar, kept it going, and then sold it back to the family for one dollar after the war. All of my friends remember exactly where they were when Pearl Harbor, VE, and VJ days happened. 
but I think the most touching story came from an Italian-American woman here in Monterey, California, where I live now. In 1999, the Monterey Italian Heritage Society sponsored a presentation called Storia, Storia Segreta. It included lectures, films, photographs, and stories about the effect of Executive Order 9066 on the Italians uh, and Italian Americans who lived in the U.S. during the war. I helped by interviewing local people and conducting each of their stories, condensing each of their stories into a short paragraph or two. Several of the people I interviewed had been sent to a camp in uh, Missoula, and that's up in uh, western Montana. Uh, they were not sure why they were singled out for internment, uh, but two of them thought it was because of their membership in the Sons of Italy. One of my interviewees was a woman who was one of five children of a local fisherman. She was a teenager in 1942. Although all of the children were born in the U.S. and therefore were citizens, the parents had been born in Italy uh, and had not yet become U.S. citizens. When Executive Order 9066 was enacted, all Italian citizens were forced to relocate to no less than 25 miles from the coast. My friend's uh, family moved from Monterey to Salinas. They were just one family of many in Monterey who had to move. Her description of the move was something like this. I remember we were packed into a truck with all of our furniture, Mama, Papa, and the five kids. We looked like the grapes of wrath. My father pulled the truck up to a house we were supposed to rent and got out to meet the owner. When the owner saw Papa, he chased him back to the car, hitting him with a broom. The farmer shouted that we had to leave, calling us dirty Italians. He said he wouldn't rant to enemy aliens. At this point in the story, point in the story, her voice broke. That word still sticks in my throat to this day. We were treated so hatefully, and we hadn't done anything. I understand why the executive order nine o six six was not part of the podcast. Uh, it wouldn't have been a subject for broadcast uh, during the war. Well, thanks so much for the comment and the insight. And certainly, there was. Um, a darker side uh, t to the war. And it's not something that we cover on the podcast because, as the listener said, it wasn't um, something that was broadcast. But, you know, there, there have been a few cases where we got a, a little bit of a preview of it. Do you recall back when we did the Pearl Harbor special uh, that there were uh, accounts of two men talking at a gas station about uh, killing a random Japanese man who just, you know, left the service station. And, of course, uh, episodes of New World Are Coming have had information on racial prejudice that occurred. Certainly, the internments that occurred during the war remain uh, some of the most controversial aspects of wartime uh, policy. And there's no question but that some uh, innocent people were seriously hurt as a result of that. And we should definitely acknowledge that, even while uh, extolling uh, some of the really uh, great acts of courage and generosity uh, that were seen uh, through the course of the war. So thanks so much. I appreciate that uh, comment. And Victoria, thanks so much for listening. Now we turn to an email from Larry. Uh, who said uh, uh, on the uh, uh, had some comments particularly regarding the D-Day uh, podcast. I've been listening to you since the days that I uh, needed to rerun uh, your intro several times just to understand you pr uh, announcing your name. At that time, I wanted to hear more of your programming and needed to to know by what name to look for it. You sometimes still confusing me. I thought you were saying King Curlin and not Ken Curlin. Uh, don't change. Well, thanks. And uh, it is Ken Curlin who provides the opening uh, theme. Uh, he says, regarding your programming for D-Day, it was outstanding. The best of any of your previous work. Your respectful speech pattern and voice was perfect for what you were presenting. I heard news programs from the time that I'd never heard before. I served from 1966 to 70. And uh, the World War II and Korean vets are still my heroes. Two things that upset me a great deal. 
One, the announcers at the time were complaining of having sore throats from talking so much and the fact that they had to stay up for 24 hours. If I had been on their draft board, I would have had them on the front lines in a matter of months and then ask how their uh, throats felt. Well, I will say in their defense, it's hard to imagine many of um, modern uh, media personalities going into that degree of uh, coverage t to continue coverage to the point that their throats did get sore. But I do uh, take your point. Uh, then uh, uh, raises another point. Uh, c Congress never uh, changes, does it? On D-Day, when thousands of men were killed, maimed, and wounded, Congress was opening investigations on Pearl Harbor, and some wanted to put uh, generals and admirals in charge in jail. Um, I, I will say, and then he has an issue with um, a recent uh, congressional investigation, and I won't go into that just because uh, don't want, really want to get bogged down in a a particular debate over current events. But I will say in general that people in 1944 probably would, wouldn't would look at it in the same way as we look at, as lo we look at congressional investigations uh, in the uh, current uh, frame of mind. Oversight of the executive branch and various uh, operations of the federal government is a, a constitutional role of Congress. And it's something that ideally we'd want to have because if there's not congressional oversight, we can have a lot of abuses from executive branch and uh, uh, military with no one really able to call them to account. I think what's happened in the last uh, few decades is that uh, television has really started to uh, started to play a role, and now that's accelerated uh, with the internet. Again, without getting into any uh, specific uh, investigations, those who've taken a side in politics, and even some of those who haven't, can think of uh, congressional investigations that were held for mere political purposes, at least in their opinion. Or, if you don't feel the hearing was held with political purposes, uh, that people on the uh, uh, panel, it can often seem like they're playing political games with it, hoping to make a uh, speech that gets on the news rather than asking a question that helps to illuminate the facts. And now, of course, with YouTube, it's become something where you make the big statement, you make the big slam, you record it, your office puts it on YouTube, and uh, as a member of Congress, you hope the video goes viral. And I think a lot of that phenomena has made us pretty wary of congressional uh, investigations, and the power and the credibility of that is severely limited for that reason. But uh, we have to be careful when ever listening to or viewing historical uh, programming not to uh, superimpose kind of our modern uh, feelings, particularly about something like Congress, because uh, I think a lot of that has really uh, evolved probably over the last 20 to 30 years. But then Larry also has a great uh, story of the war. Uh, he says, uh, I forgot, uh, I do have a story about World War II vets. For the last 25 years of my working life, I was a registered nurse in the cardiac division of a large hospital in North Carolina. I took care of a lot of men that served during World War II. As I had served in the late uh, 60s, it was always an honor to take care of these men and some of the women who also served. One thing I learned was that even if one of them had senior dementia or Alzheimer's, they could remember a certain number. I took care of one man who'd forgotten his wife's name even though they'd been married more than 50 years. I then asked him to tell me his military service number, uh, different than the social security number used today. He did not hesitate and gave it to me immediately. Uh, there were only a handful of veterans out of the 200 plus I took care of that did not remember this number. And when they told me, uh, each of them stiffened a bit as if going to attention no matter how sick they were. Today I do not remember my wife's cell phone number or her birthday or the exact date of our anniversary. 
but I sure do remember my military ID numbers. Uh, and uh, he writes, uh, finally, uh, so many of us have always said, when I have time, I'll write a book. I admire you for chasing your dreams and doing just that. Don't ever let those nattering uh, nabobs of negativism, a, a reference to Sparrow Agnew, deter you from your goal. Best to you and your obviously understanding wife, uh, Grandpa Larry. Well, thanks so much, uh, Larry. I do appreciate your service and uh, your comments. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your insights. All right. Well, that will do it for today. As I said, we have... Uh, A mere uh, 13 days to go. I hope you'll be listening as the curtain comes down on the war. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, kencurlin.com. And this podcast is offered as a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.